by a consumer tech company. So we've set up globally cross-functional team structures that deliver product journeys, digital product journeys, um, that are global in nature. And then we take those and then we localize them. So we're not building something twice. And that may happen, we might spin up a team to do that here. We might do that in London, and we've got support from all around the world. So we are taking much more of a consumer tech focus into how we do the product. And in, in that process, is there a lot of uh, talking to customers and saying, look, how can we make this better? Or are you taking the Steve Jobs approach, which is like, they don't know, we'll just make it better? No, we're absolutely including customers into this. Yeah. So there's, there's user testing, there's, we, I try and avoid focus groups if I can, but... Um, so Why is that? What's wrong with I've been in lots of focus groups. What's wrong with that? It changes the nature of how people use the product when the moment they're being asked a bunch of leading questions. Yeah. So I, I'll give you a really good example, actually. So when we, in this market, so we know that everyone is completely um, uh, in, on the mobile all the time, right? The, the actual penetration of mobile in the market is over two times better. Don't use the word penetration of mobile together. It doesn't okay, work so, 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 Apparently sorry. people would rather use mobile than penetrate. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, the views around security on mobile are very, very different. So if you think about the security profile of people here, we have six-digit pins, a lot of places have four-digit pins. Um, people are, still have this inherent mistrust of banking on a mobile device. And we were doing a focus group um, recently, actually with a bunch of millennials, and this really surprised me, where we were talking about um, pin access to, to a product. and. They raised the issue, should we make this an eight-digit pin? So they were, they were that terrified of what was going on. Um, that, uh, but I don't think that's a reality of actually how they would use a product, but that's my problem with focus. I'm surprised they didn't say, that I just use my thumb, thumb, or my eyes, my iris, or voice recognition. So is there, are you really out there? Like, is there a group within you that's like really out there? Who's looking at, you know, iris recognition, voice recognition, and... Yeah, so we do have people looking... Yeah. Internet of Things, blockchain, artificial yeah, we'll talk about that all that good stuff. So, so they said, right, I want more and more security, right? So, so, so I want to know a bit about um, the, the UX bit, because in the banking world, you know, I, I've always found it as a customer very weird, because it starts off online, and then you go, actually, you know, it's so bad, I'd rather talk to somebody. <laughs> so, I, I invest money, the little that I have, I invest, and it's so nice to go and have a nice free cup of coffee and have somebody treat me like I'm a king, although they're probably you know, getting commission and all that, whatever. But, you know, they sit me down on a nice leather seat, and you know, that experience compared to sitting on the internet and going, oh, Christ, where do I go now? And, you know, is, you know, I've got to look at this chart and that chart. So is the, are we moving into a world where the you know, high street banks are going to get closed down, or is it like, just leave it for an elite of people who have more than 500,000 dollars in their bank account? And the rest can just go online because they're all plebs. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I'm not putting those words in your mouth. Alright. I do. Um, I, I think long, long term the nature of the branch will, will need to change. Right? So if we get simple financial products and services should be able to be easily sold online. And right now that's still really difficult. So what do you call a simple, like, car insurance, okay. travel insurance? Travel insurance, opening a bank account is relatively yeah. straightforward. We should be able yeah. to do that. A mortgage journey, on the other hand, is a far more emotionally involved process. So you may still want to talk to someone. Plus there's also the issue of um, investment products and advice. So there are isn't, regulations isn't, around. Is the internet just peppered with mortgage calculators. I mean, when I was looking for a mortgage, you know, it was almost like flash games of mortgage yeah, calculators. Mortgage calculators are only one part of actually yeah. a much longer journey than that's a customer true. goes on, right? So how do you provide the content, the service around that? How do you talk to someone um, who can give you good advice about that? Does that mean that that couldn't be accomplished online? No. But that's going to take longer to develop those more complex things so people do get comfortable on that. Right now, remember, we make you go through we, you log on to mobile banking, we still make these, there's no touch ID, there's no soft tokens, you still have to whip this thing out and, and, and put in all these numbers. It's not easy. So we're not even at the point where people can do simple product transactions in a more frictionless way online. So to get them to, to, to actually do a complex investment, we're not there yet. We've, we've actually got to, we've got to take people with us. 
Because re- again, I'll go back to the point, HSBC, whether we like it or not in this market, is held to a higher standard. And people expect more of us and where the community banks. So we have to we have to service a wider part of the community. So are you going to close the high street banks? No. And, and they're, actually, they're all like migrating into Premier. Well, the one in Quarry Bay is like plebs, ground floor, you know, ATM machine. New lot, got a bit more gosh upstairs. Leather coat, leather sofas, coffee. I know. I'm not going to talk about branches. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll tell you what. No, I'll tell you, I'm just curious because it's part of the user experience, right? Because if, if, if I could do it online, and then when I walk in, I go, hello, Napoleon. Uh, you're, I saw you just had a question about this thing. Should we sit down and talk about it? I'm, I'm not, I'm bringing it back to digital. I don't, I don't give a fuck about branches either. But the experience, experience, you know, I, I come from the retail world of omni-channel O2O, right? And there it's like, you see a product online, you kind of find the size, and you go when you go to the shop, when you arrive at the shop, theoretically, the shop assistant will say, Napoleon, we've got your shoes, they're in the corner, you know, there's a nice pair of jeans, do you want to, right? So why can't that work in banking? It can. So really, what? Yeah. So th- th- you're, you're doing this thing of going back to what your experiences were, I suppose, to what they were oh, in the future. Yeah. So this is, this is how we have to build this. This is what we're okay. building now, is that capability. So you would have an experience that would journey, the journey, try to go from one on, online to, to a store, basically. Again, you can do that. Yeah. I think what we want to create is a channel of choice for people where they can do any journey that they want to. Yeah. And if they need to go into a branch, either for regulatory reasons yeah. or because they still need to talk to somebody, they can do that. This has an advantage actually within the branch network is that if you can take low value transactions out of branches that just tie people up, yeah. the branch staff can then spend their time actually adding value to a conversation yeah. with the customer. So there's a there's a there's a very real and beneficial trade-off on that. So we have to make the mobile the digital channels more easy to use and accessible, and that's what we need to do. That's not because we don't know how to do it, it's just in terms of we can build those journeys. Our ability to execute because of a lot of internal processes, legacy processes, and legacy technology platforms hasn't caught up with where we need to be and what customer expectations are. And that's why we're hiring in all of these people to try So let's go back to that piece. So, so you're, you're in a big organization. Does somebody come in who goes, like, I'm going to shake this up? And how does that person get the authority to shake it up, right? Your boss, and then the uh, another Andrew. Another Andrew, yeah. So well, I'm curious because, right, you know, somebody comes in and then they've got to hire and they. How do you, how do you get yeah, so the that authority? Starts, so that starts. That starts. At, that like starts a, at the group level. That's okay. where your. That's where your 1.7 billion dollar conversation yeah. happens. That's where we go. So the, the guy we hired at the group level to run digital globally comes from Google. Okay. Um, the guy who runs commercialization globally comes from Apple. So the, our CIO for the retail bank we just hired in comes from uh, Alibaba and Financial. So these are big, um, these are big hires. Where this is, this is seriously about trying to change yeah. the bank and, and, and make. And they get the authority with it. They don't just get the. the well, if I gave you 1.2 billion dollars, I'm sure I'd expect something back from yeah, you. Yeah, of course. So then, how does that trickle down? How do you do you work in a kind of uh, like a, an island by yourselves, or do you you know you kind of going and evangelizing and walking around? And how do you get you know an existing organization to buy into what you're doing? Because people I've spoken to in all kinds of organizations, there's so much resistance. You know, I feel like sometimes I feel like I'm kind of pushing the Bible to people who. You know, they're so, so rightly or wrongly, my observation is well, I've been here a long time, is that it's a very hierarchical place. So the message comes down from the top that this is what we're going to do. Um, yes, you can get pockets of resistance, but by and large, once people get on board with that message and realize that this is what we're going to do, they start to move on. Right. So that's, that's a really good thing for us here, that we can actually mobilize and begin to make these changes. Um, so I think people are beginning to feel that. The fact that now actually, so by the time we're done hiring within digital, in Hong Kong alone, we should be somewhere close to about 600 people. You can't ignore that size and weight of um, people trying to change stuff within an organization. So let's so talk about the timing so, right. So 600, and then I saw uh, 300 of whom were going into Causeway Bay and uh, yeah. WeWork. Yeah. Why, why would a bank allow that to happen? 
Why wouldn't they? It's cheaper, right? I think that was a very interesting head, head, sub, subhead from the SCMB is that so bank denies cost saving measures and it's a weird. When did cost saving become a bad thing? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I won't talk about whether it saved money or not, but the fact is we also still need to recruit the right talent into the organisations to do this. Yeah. We don't have the right workspaces set up to be collaborative. We still have, you know, it's, it's a bank it's and there's policies, right? So, yeah. There are bits of it that are good. There's, we, we have good teams, but yeah. renovating all that stuff and co-locating all of those people in one place creates a lot of upheaval within the organization. So it's much easier to put them all in one place, make sure that they can do what they need to do, and then later on we'll figure out how to bring them back. Here. So whilst you're in WeWork, uh, are you going to have pitch nights where promising startups can come and pitch to you and say, hey, I've got, have I got a good idea? Yeah, I've got a good idea. Yeah, we'll do that. So let, let's get down to some granular stuff. Um, you've got a lot of customer information. Yes. Right? Is there a, is there a big data play there? I, is, uh, you know, you know a lot about you know, your community, then, right? So you know people from childhood through to you know, university. Yeah. So is, is a, do you see an interesting role there to play with that? Because at the moment, I don't, as a, as a receiver, recipient. Oh, absolutely. So you know this being a customer, right? I know this being a customer. When they send you messaging, it does not feel personal or targeted or like they know you at all. Um, and so, again, part of this overall transformation process is making sure that we can connect up properly the data parts behind this and get a proper view of how to talk to a customer. So data actually fundamentally underpins everything that we need to do in the future. And it's, it's, it's absolutely critical because there's no way that I can... A really good example, just on the website, right? So again, eight months ago, two months ago, no one's having a conversation, which is how do you put a persistent cookie across both your PIB and do your sorry your personal banking login session and your customer website, your front end website, so that when I actually land back on the public website, I show you something that's relevant to you, not a product that maybe you've already bought. Well, Amazon's been doing this for nearly 20 years. Um, so, those simple things we still aren't doing properly. So that, again, the upside on this is enormous just by getting those things right. And the amount that we know about a customer and the amount that we can enhance the relationship is huge. So you're saying there's a mood to use all of that data? Absolutely. So, and so have you hired like data analysts? Or? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got, scientists, we've got, I think is a fancy word, right? I have. How many scientists? I'm unsure how many scientists we have. But, uh, but, That's yeah, good so. to hear. That's good to hear. Uh, so I, I want to talk a little bit about the um, about some of the crypto stuff, right? Because in fintech in, in this town, you hear a lot about you know Bitcoin and blockchain. And it does it, if you work in a bank. Does that really come on your radar, or is it like, yeah, that's kind of, you know, people who've been smoking pot or something? Is no, not, not on a day-to-day -day basis, it certainly doesn't, but for, for, for the majority of the bank, so they don't necessarily understand or want to understand the value of what a blockchain could do. However, there are pockets within the bank that are exploring this, and that's right, it's, not, it's still not a mainstream technology. Um, we're actually involved in, I think, three projects at the moment with, with the with the HTML. So there's one on mortgages, there's one on trade finance, and there's another one on um, uh, digital identity. So we are beginning to explore those. Um, there's a lot of value to be had out of them. They're certainly not mainstream yet. We will bring those on board um, as and when we can prove that they can add value and how do we integrate that back into the system. So uh, about a year ago, I went to the UK, and everywhere I went, I saw posters for, you know, sign up for Apple Pay, you go to, yeah. is, has that has that taken off in this town? It's, it's I, well, I see, actually. like, when you go to the supermarket, is, it, is, it, is it, are there any numbers you can share? No, I can't share. Like, that. general industry numbers, not your numbers? Is, no, there, is, there, is there adoption? No, so it's Apple lock this stuff down pretty Does anybody in this stuff. room know what the numbers are? Sorry? Go and do some get in there, something. <laughs> Hack something. Cafe Pacific. I want to know, I mean, are people using, how many of you in here use Apple Pay to buy stuff in Hong Kong? What do you buy? Mendel. Convenience store. Anybody buying anything more than convenience store supermarket? Starbucks. Starbucks. Lunch. Lunch. There you go. 
So what's happening in the mobile payment world? Give us like an overview. So mobile payments, and you, that whole space is going to change dramatically over the next 12 to 24 months. So you've got the SVF license coming in. There's can you, can you unwrap so, that? So SVF, for, for, for those of you who don't know, so this basically brings into regulation Alipay, Tencent, um, and creates a framework for payments. Um, but there's some startups here, like TNG or whatever, who've got... Yeah, sure, and, right. and, and they've, done, they've done very well, actually. Yeah. They, so it gives you a license, and what does that license do? That, that allows you to basically hold value in yeah. a network-based way. So it's very similar to an octopus card. So, yeah. if you, so octopus actually also applied for a yeah. stored value license. Yeah. Um, and what's really interesting about the stored value license is it does this. Is it, it lowers the KYC requirements. KYC? Know your customer. So the opt all those questions that a bank needs to ask you to make you a customer okay. basically go away until you hit a certain threshold. That creates a frictionless engagement path for these customers, for these for these new platforms to use. So banks can't really do that very easily unless they also apply for the network. So I Alipay, Tencent, Fearsome over the border. Um, banks in China in 2015 lost about 20 billion dollars US in um, transaction fees to these banks. So this 20 billion. 20 billion yeah. to. Alibaba and Tencent. Yeah, just in lost transactions. A lot of a lot of that's online, right? Um, uh, in Hong Kong, so so they, those players are going to start to come into this market, and I think things are going to change. So WeChat and DBS kind of covered up. WeChat and DBS covered up yesterday. Yeah. Um, uh, Alipay is here. They haven't really gone out in full force. So I expect they're going to be pushing um, single pay a lot. Alipay's got about 1.3 million accounts in Hong Kong already. Um, that's mainly for cross-border trade, yeah. but you know, they've got an engagement platform for customers. This is Was Alipay big on Strawberry Net when you were there? Yeah, certainly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so payments is going to change. Apple Pay's here. You've got an incumbent in Octopus. And changing that habit that people have is really, really hard. It took, it took Octopus about seven years to develop the tab habit. And it's debatable whether the Apple Pay transaction is good enough to displace that over a long period of time. You've got to drive really, really hard to displace habits. Um, but I think it's possible. Um, but uh, so, so that whole, the whole payments industry is going to be Really, really exciting. But do you think I, I was reading that, like in the US, a lot of the banks launch their own payment, right? Yeah. So is Apple Pay an educator, and then you come in and you say, you know, trash that. We've got our own system. Is it all about ownership of people? Yeah. Ultimately, really, yeah. because you know, distribution models have to change when actually the real economy is in attention. So if you, if you own the customer relationship. You own the customer, and you can you can sell the rentals. You can tell them anyone behind. So, so you have to think differently about how you're going to engage customers. So, Apple Pay, Apple Pay. If you look at the UK, for example, no tap habit. Launched Apple Pay, wasn't really going anywhere. Transport for London enabled it, and Payway. All of a sudden, all of the NFC payments in London in, in the UK just started to do this. Obviously, right? Because um, what they they merged the because it because it was a habit. Yeah. It was something that people did on a daily basis. Yeah. They enabled the habit. Um, in there are very very few successful markets in mobile payments. I would argue um, the US Apple Pay it, it, it's hugely fragmented. Um, China's probably the only real player. India, India's one to watch. They've got some interesting um, regulation that's enabling it. So. And Hong Kong's a great place. You know, it's, it's small, um, it's easy to enable. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's, the, the showdown over the next 24 months is going to be very good. Yeah. Right, nice. So I want to take a question from the floor. You've all been quite patient. Oh, there you are. That went out quickly. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Yeah, you can come in. I don't know if the mic works. I actually have three questions. That's okay. So much longer. Eric, Eric. All right, so the first question is the easy one. Just just for context, the 1.2 billion we're talking about, from what it sounds like, this is purely consumer-facing groups. Right? These are not internal ones. 
uh, in terms of digital. See, this is a group of digital artists. Is that specific consumer thing? No, so that covers so that covers a lot of the technology implementation as well. So this is about this is about back end platforms. That that investment, as I said, so that investment is there to take out cost from the business. So right now if you apply for a credit card, it goes into a back end system and a lot of people have to touch that as well as data. But the end goal is all for the consumer in terms of the consumer. Well the right point is yeah, it has to be, right? Um these are kind of related, but second question is more, uh, so right now I have banking with different areas of it, as you can see, so digital solutions are actually often quite different. So when you talk about the global solutions, you talk about going forward, ignoring what's happened so far, is it meant to be common, or are they different for legal It's a, that's a very good question. Um, right, I don't, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there's any reason they're different for legal solutions. HSBC is a big place, and they run different organizations, and I just think they have slightly different agendas at the moment. We do try and figure out how to do this. So, to give you an example, if, if you set up a business account with the commercial bank, and they find out all this information about you, and then you walk next door and you try and open a retail banking account, they're going to ask you all the same information again. Yep, that's, that's happened. Yeah, exactly. So, so there are certain programs that we understand could help solve that. That's why for us things like digital identity become really important. If we can, if we can enable that across our systems and federate that information, then you can just walk into the bank next door and right, um, we just benefit to do that. Yeah. So the third question, which sort of brings things together, in terms of prioritization, 1.2 billion, a lot of things to be done, there's a lot of areas that can be improved. In terms of what you're actually gonna prioritize work on, uh, whether it's in terms of the solution, uh, how much value you're offering the consumer, or per area, is there sort of, how, how, what's the strategy for picking what you actually going to work on? Is that going to differ region by region? Is it global? Um, so is your question by like product, or is it by... By product, by region, and, and actually, sorry, the other part I wanted to add in was, do, do us as a consumer, as a consumer, have, have a say in that? So it comes back to how much of our feedback is going into you deciding that's actually a better value add, or are you working out based on cost of it? So, that, that is a great question. Again, that's where I tried to start this, which was that the initial the initial deployment of that $1.2 billion was about taking out cost. Um, and that's, that was always the conversation. Like, we've, got, we've got so much time left before the funding runs out and, you've got to, and we've got to take all the cost out of the business. And that's not the, right, that's not the right way to frame that question. The question is, how do we deliver better customer experiences faster? Because um, if, if you frame the question right, it will take out the cost anyway. Um, in terms of what do we focus on, so, <laughs> Uh, our global head of digital has a view that prioritization is for wusses. So we just we just build capacity as much as we can and try and build as much as we can um, in parallel. So as long as the demand is there, we're going to keep trying to fund it and, and, and create the capacity to build and build and build. Um, in terms of the geography of where that goes, so the two home markets, um, Hong Kong and the UK, and then the next, the, we, we do have a set of markets um, that we have prioritized after that. A lot of it's to do with, do they have the capacity to actually take on this in this time, the, the amount of change that we need to push through. I have a question about the doodle identity. Uh, I remember a few years ago, there was this e-certificate or something with the government, and it, you had to get some really hardware. Use, yeah. You had to buy some hardware that you put next to your computer, then you had to scan something, and then you had to go to the website and it popped up. So what, what is digital identity? Is it an avatar? Is it a Pokemon Go character? What, what, what? I, I'm confused. Yeah, it should be. I'm much more interested. What, what is digital identity? Is it a thumbprint? I, I, no. What, what is it? No. So, so I, I, I think there are I think there are a number of different answers to this. From, from our point of view, we know a lot about an individual because of all this stuff that we need to ask you to make sure that it's an art So, you know, we know your name, we know your telephone number, your date of birth. Um, you know, generally where your source of funds are coming from. So we do all of this work to find out something about you, and then it's almost like we forget about you. So the next time, so the next time you walk into a branch, you still need to sign for stuff. You still need to check your ID. You have to pull that out. So how do we create a system where we can take that 
data that we have about you and make that available within our own banking system. So again, moving from one part of the business to another. So it could be you walk into the retail bank, they say, I want to, I want to take out all this money. Maybe they just send a notification, uh, um, some sort of push to your phone, you authenticate on your phone, that's it, the transaction's done, it's that much. So it's about how do we take all of this information we know about you and provide that as a service back out to other businesses, potentially. So how do we federate that information and make it available? So maybe you're buying insurance or something. Um, the insurance company, or actually a mortgage transaction. A solicitor asks you a lot of the same information that we would ask you. Why, why are we duplicating that? Why does the solicitor then have to do all the storage costs of holding all of that information for you for X number of years? If they can ping a service and say, is this, the, or is this person who they say they are, and, and find a way to authenticate that, we can lower the overall transaction. So it's like the original idea that Microsoft had with their passport, right? So that you could, 15 years and ago. That, you could, and that's one use case for it, but, and there's loads of them. By using facial recognition, I mean, I, I, I heard recently it's going pretty damn good, right? Can I just walk into the bank and go, right, yeah, 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 there you go, here's your money. Why don't you just recognize my face? Do you have to go through any more complicated? Is that imprint not strong enough? There is a lot you need to go through to get there. Yeah. Um, so are we working? Again, this comes down to, um, back, take, take the example of account opening, right? So you should be able to do that from your mobile phone. So upload a copyright ID card, take a picture or a video of yourself, validate that it's you, you're done, we've done the ID and the piece. How do we then also use all of this, all of these other data sources to validate you are who you say you are? So a good use case would be, say that we need to verify an address, which is part of the process of, of opening a, uh, an account. Do you give us your phone number? Actually, if the data sources are correct and you give a bank permission, if we've done a deal with the telco that says, has your phone been in this location consistently over the last 60 days? We don't need to do anything else. We know from the data sources, and we can make, make smarter decisions and faster decisions about how to all be something. So all of this technology should I'm looking be forward to that. Another question? <laughs> all right, yeah. <laughs> Developers.hsbc.com. That's what I want as a developer. When are we going to get your APIs? <laughs> oh. I don't know, is the answer, I'll be perfectly honest. I don't know, um, but you know, it's something, it, it's a conversation that we should be having, frankly. And so I, I, think, it, I think there's value in it. Um, but you feel the whole middleware thing, though. so you're moving yeah, so towards that, right? The middleware, at this point in time, is to do two things. It's to, it's to enable us to build our own products and services, and it's to connect into the legacy stuff. Exposing services for public use is a, is a whole other matter. And do, do I agree that we should be making those data available? Yes. Are we there yet? Not yet. But you know, again, that's, I'm open to obtaining that and putting that through. So, yeah. Developers.hsbc.com.hk. FSS. Andrew, thanks for sharing. I'm curious to find out like people like you from the internet world. And just now you mentioned the global CIOs from the Ed Financial, right? And stepping into HSBC and having to deal with all these legacies. Having to deal with all these legacies. Right? So how do you feel as you know all these things need to resolve where you shouldn't exist in a startup, right? So so I'd like to get a perspective on that and also how the you know, global CIO feel about stepping into this. And and you know like I, I, I would presume your will is probably this high, right? And you kind of wow, you know. And instead of getting things done, you know, Days or hours, right? You're talking about months, right? You're talking about things going on end of this year and we've been looking at this for months, right? So I just like your perspective on that. And what are the, some of the critical things that you think leaders are using to get right in an organization like HSBC? <coughs> what a question, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 so, as far as I know, he just does more marathons. So, so first of all, um, I, I, I can't comment for the, how the CIO of Land Financial feels about this. Um, so, for me, there, there were there were three reasons actually for, for joining and for going through all of this. The first is um, financial services is one of the last really big industries 
to go through um, the digital structure. So publishing's done it, travel has done it, um, e commerce, retail. No, no, they haven't done it. They're going through it. They're pretending yeah. they're doing they, it. They like, are. Like all fashion no, I, people. I, I, and that, that you can argue. Well, just, <laughs> well, I spent three years selling to retailers. Bollocks. In Hong Kong, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Hong Kong's a slight microcosm of the world in terms of retail e commerce. They're, they're too busy e wearing black. So financial, so the timing is really right to, to try and change an industry. So I think that, and that's really exciting, and that that that, that does it. A, a very selfish point of view was that when we started having this conversation, it was oh good, so I get to come in and try and fix all the stuff that I hate about internet banking and all this stuff. So it's scratching my own itch, which is I want better services from my bank, so I can help participate in delivering those. That's a great thing to be able to do. The third one is I've. I've had a very long relationship with HSBC. I've been a customer of for 30 years. And I also understand that HSBC has a unique relationship with Hong Kong, whose family is.